And in 1991, I was in graduate school at the University of Florida, and I read an article in um, Emerge Magazine uh, by Dr. Robert Bullard, who is the father of environmental justice. And that's the first time I'd ever heard of the concept. Everything that we deal with in environmental justice involves the physical environment, uh, air, land, water, soil, climate change. Trauma and food uh, goes together uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, you think about individuals that work uh, sometimes 40, sometimes 80 hours a week or even more, and they're still unable to provide food for their families. Well, I was at Tennessee State University, uh, and I was approached by an organization called Tying Nashville Together, and they were doing a uh, a food survey, a food analysis of the food landscape across Nashville. And they were trying to determine if there was a difference in terms of service and quality and price uh, from one part of town to the next. And they wanted me to map those results. So when I took the data from tying Nashville together and mapped it out, I noticed that there were some communities that didn't have any grocery stores. Oftentimes we know what's going on in our community, but when you see it strategically mapped out, um, where people have been living for generations and generations, don't have access to healthy food, but then again, what can we do to make sure that we are providing the healthy food choices for our community? It's interesting, the interrelationship with intergenerational food insecurity, particularly in the North Nashville area. If I am a low-wage earner and I then have children, it is highly likely that they will also be food insecure. Then that is repeated generation after generation. And in North Nashville, what we have seen is that as a result of wealth that was robbed of African Americans uh, decades ago uh, when Interstate 40 was cut through North Nashville and property values decreased, that we have been on a trend upward relative to food insecurity related to that family economic well-being status. Unfortunately, in capitalism, you have winners and losers. You can't have capitalism without poverty. You can't have capitalism without unemployment. It has to be as part of it. You can have winners and losers. And so what happens is that without any kind of land use control specifically designed to preserve space to serve people, if, if all land use is, decisions are driven based upon pure economics, then yes, you're gonna have food deserts. For retailers, it's a, it's a bottom line. Are we going to make a profit in this community or not? Or in some cases, do we believe we can make a profit in this community or not? So what's really difficult for food retailers or any retailer is to deal with communities that are in transition. Based upon their models, they'll say, well, this won't work because uh, there's no majority population here and we will not capture the entire market. Uh, and so those who are more mobile, have cars, access to private vehicles, if they don't like what's built, they're gonna go shop wherever, you know, because they can move, and then you'll be, quote unquote, stuck with what's left. Uh, so that, that's a challenge of, uh, you know, how to, you know, maintain the demographic characteristics of a community while changing the food landscape. We serve meals uh, in a number of ways, and meals are very, very important uh, for our community. We serve hot meals. So you think about individuals that are unhoused. Uh, if we were to give them a box of food, 
although they may have the food, they're unable to have a place or a space where they could cook the food. Uh, you think about even having a can opener. Uh, if you're unhoused, you don't have a can opener if you were to give canned goods away to individuals. So we specifically have hot meals where you're able to come on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 10 a.m. to 12 o'clock p.m. We serve 250 meals a day, which is 500 meals a week. We need to actually look back at what are the drivers of that food insecurity that is then driving the nutrition insecurity. And what we usually find is that there are multiple barriers. That's why we can't just address just the food. What's driving the food insecurity? The lack of funds to buy the food that you need to stay healthy. A common strategy to address food insecurity is food pantries. But that doesn't lift people up and out of the situation. Um, so what we have been focusing on is how do we get to a more strategic, kind of systematic change in the dynamics in North Nashville. The, the threat to urban agriculture in Nashville is gentrification. Years ago, there was a kind of a compromise. Okay, you can do urban agriculture in Nashville, but when that landowner says, you know what, I think I want to build some skinny houses on this property. People have no rights. Once the price point hits uh, for a developer to sell, that's it. I mean, we saw this play out in East Nashville when Walmart attempted to place a Walmart neighborhood store in East Nashville years ago. It was hugely controversial because, again, you had the black residents who had been there in East Nashville who said, we need a store here, we need jobs. The newly arriving white gentrifiers who had the luxury of getting political about food said, oh, we don't want Walmart here. So there was a lot of negotiation, but at the end of the day, it only got the support of the black residents. The white gentrifiers snubbed it. And guess what? That Walmart ended up closing down. Well, I always go back to history. What have we been doing? And it, what we've been doing is not incorrect. But what we have to understand is that food insecurity, nutrition insecurity, and also food sustainability, OK? Food system sustainability, that they're all interrelated, and that we have to run in multiple lanes of the interstate at the same time. Food insecurity is the absence of one's ability to purchase the food that they need um, just to eat, basically eat and not be hungry. We then move into a category of nutrition insecurity. So we may have the food that we need in order to overcome hunger, but that food is not healthy and it is not providing the nutrients that one needs. That's one of the things, that's one of the characteristics of a food desert that leads to poor health, is that people who live in food challenged environments tend to eat fast food more. And we know that there's nothing healthy about fast food. Food insecurity lays a pretty solid foundation for nutrition insecurity. And then we take a look at nutrition insecurity and that then drives health. Uh, chronic, chronic diseases, it drives maternal health outcomes. We then look at um, children and their development is compromised as a result of food insecurity. It is also been contributed to uh, mental health and higher rates of substance abuse, depression. And lastly, if we step back and we look at this from an economic perspective, um, it is also driving uh, healthcare costs up as food insecurity numbers continue to trend up. It's a very difficult um, road to, to navigate in terms of moving towards food justice. It's, it's not easy because there are so many political and economic moving parts. What I would like for our government to do uh, to strengthen our food access and food sustainability is to make sure that they are incorporating nonprofit organizations 
organizations that are doing the work, uh, organizations that are grassroots, that are there with the people every day to come to them to see how they can work alongside of the organizations instead of working in silos. We know that in Nashville, if you've ever tried to use public transit here, especially if you've lived places like New York or Chicago or DC where public transit actually kind of works, and then you come here, and you're like, what is going on here? You know, you're used to a bus coming every 15 minutes, no, oh, every hour here, and, and, and you know, <laughs> don't miss the connection. Uh, there was uh, some students, I can't remember whether they were from Vanderbilt or Belmont, Years ago, they did an experiment where they said, how long would it take for us to go to a grocery store on the bus and back? Just riding the bus, not shopping, took three hours. Now imagine that, you got your kids, you got groceries, it's summertime, not gonna have, not gonna work. If you are a low income worker and you are not making a living wage, and the cost of food is trending up, but your wages aren't trending up as fast as food is going up, and you are also uh, spending a significant portion of your income on transportation, then that is a driver of food insecurity. If housing prices are going up and there is less and less affordable housing, and you're finding yourself having to pay more and more of your income for housing, there's less money to spend on food. If you don't have access to health care and you have a um, medical incident, that also can contribute to um, your inability to spend money on food. And we all know we've had these multiple uh, conversations about medical debt and how that then compromises someone's ability uh, to get credit or to participate in the economic kind of development system because of their credit rating. Sometimes we have to do things that make us uncomfortable and so I don't know I mean I'm I try to be optimistic because you can look all around uh, downtown Nashville. You see the investments from the standpoint of a certain demographic, right? Billions of dollars, no problem. But you would think, okay, if we can invest that much money in, in this, that, and the other, uh, then can't we make some investments in, in some of our underserved communities? But that just, that's that old Nashville, new Nashville argument. We have a three, four, five billion dollar stadium, but we don't have grocery stores. You have to challenge yourself to see a, a different vision. We have not done a good job of keeping community as part of the engagement process. And I, that has to change. We need to distill the data, whether you're doing research or you're running a government program or a nonprofit program, how does that information get back to the community? I don't know what that is, but I think we have an opportunity to figure it out, borrowing from other communities. We do not have to recreate the wheel. We've made a lot of progress here. You know, I think that, I don't know if we're gonna be a model for solving and resolving food insecurity, but we're certainly not as is in this position a lot of other large cities are, certainly not. Everything doesn't rest with government. Sometimes the best solutions and the most, and those that are sustainable rest outside of government. And that may be the largest challenge we have is how do we call the table, leverage government, and empower community.